Andy Murray's between Wimbledon was ended by Roger Federer as the Swiss played the record equal in 7th SW19 triumph and a 17th Grand Slam title. Murray, 25, was aiming to become the first British man since Fred Perry in 1936 to lift a major trophy. But 30-year-old Federer won 4-6, 7-5, 6-3, 6-4 on center court to match the mark set by Pete Sampras and reclaim the world number one, rank and dot less and be are greater than. My team were meant to tell me to hurry up if I was going to okay. slip. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on now to the accreditation. So as you know, um, we've always delivered a, a, a free digital training day, but it was as a result of working with the Cloch project down at the Glamorgan Archives um, that we saw the potential of maybe turning what was a, a basic training day in you know, best practice for digitizing mm -hmm. into an accredited course. So um, the Cloch project had worked closely with the Workers' Education Authority to develop that, that as a unit. But then, because we're based in Aberystwyth, we needed to find someone to co-operate and to partner with us to be able to enable us to deliver that uh, further afield. Some of these are some of the trainees. I think there might be a few that Caris Evans trained, and the three on the right are um, gentlemen that I trained. This was a project to enable uh, individuals under the age of 25 to start working within the sector, and it provided them with skills and training to enable that. So it was really good for us to be a part of that. So we started delivering the accreditation element of our basic training days. Once we had established a partnership between Dusky Bro, which are based here, and I'm glad to say that Denise Owen and Linda James are with us here today. Thank you both for attending. Um, these are just pictures then, and I'm not sure if I can, if this is still working. You see um, Alan George and Steve Brewer attended, <laughs> attended our training session at the Tidville Training Centre, which we continue to work with, with um, people who are out of work and unmarried mothers. We do a two-hour workshop with them, which is hopefully getting them to embrace heritage, to maybe um, interest them in their lives or whatever. But there's these gentlemen up here, um, were part of the REACH program, which found work for people out of work, but they had to go through this specific training. And I'm happy to say that the four people that we accredited and did the training and, and are now certified were these four young lads. And you wouldn't think that they'd be interested in heritage, but one of them actually said to me, do you know, after doing this course, I actually want to go and buy my own scanner. <laughs> and that was so heartwarming because they kept them out of the room until the last minute until, if you remember, Carries, until we started the training and we were a bit worried about this. And they were shouting out the window in the breaks and things, but they turned out to be the most amazing young fellows. And I'm really glad that they've learned a new skill that they may put to use in whatever they do with their lives now. So we've done a number of uh, training sessions since then. We work very closely with Velma Hather at the Kamal, who helped us organize three very special sector days. So they did all the organizing, um, the rooms, the venues, the food, um, even booked the sector staff onto these. And I think in total, we trained about 38 to 40. Um, most of them went on, in fact, yes, all of them went on to do the accreditation. In total, over this last financial year, we've delivered training in over 30 places to over 300 people, and 148 are actually doing the accreditation, and a third of those 
are actually now qualified. So that's quite something. And it has probably been the best year ever since the refresh of the new site, because we have a fabulous site to work with now. <coughs> so these are just some photos of some training sessions. And while I was at the Digital Past earlier on this year, which was organised by the Royal Commission, a gentleman came up to me from the Glamorgan Archives and told me something really special. And I asked Hannah Price at Glamorgan Archives whether she would take the opportunity of going and recording what he said, because I wanted to share that with all of you. And bear in mind, this gentleman has worked at the Glamorgan Archives for ages, has been digitising for ages, and this is what David Hale had to say. So if I can click this on. The digitisation accreditation was a little more in-depth than I was expecting, but that uh, came out to be its own reward. Um, I think the difference between the photographs that we're producing from documents now um, is quite substantial. Um, the photographs we used to take were very good, now they're excellent. I think it's important that we go out of our way to provide the best service and the best product that we can for the customers. Um, this has given me the opportunity um, and the enthusiasm to go on uh, and take other courses uh, and learn more about digitisation. So lovely. What a lovely, lovely comment to make about the, the accreditation. So I'm just going to show you some pictures quickly now of some of the various training days that we hold uh, across Wales. Newtown Library. And we've got Kate here today, which I'm really pleased. Thank you very much for attending. Um, and Newtown Library, of course, is all part and parcel of the um, Powys Land and Llehanis groups. They all, they all came to the training days. And then in Dolgelle. And here, of course, at the National Library. So staff and volunteers have been attending all the training sessions. Harrison Berry and delivered training up at the Amgiedfa Goriel Gwynedd Museum. And I'm going to finish here because this particular um, group has touched us. I mean, it was thanks to Avril Jones who gave me a quick phone call one day when, when I was on my way to deliver a presentation in Cardiff. And she said, are you going to be at the Royal Bath Show tomorrow? Because I want you to meet a very special lady called Viv Craig from the um, Girl Guiding Movement in Wales. And I said yes, and I met Viv, instantly fell in love with her. And Viv had approached Avril. Avril had been out to Bron Iron. Um, to have a look at their archives, which they hopefully want to deposit here at the National Library of Wales. But what were they going to do with it once it was deposited? And Avril suggested that our team go in and digitise so that they had copies. And that's what we started doing. We've delivered a number of training sessions now. I've delivered one, Rian has, and Berian has delivered training. And I invited Viv to say a few words about that relationship because we've seen potential here now in developing um, simpler sessions for the brownies and the younger guides and hopefully um, we want to develop a badge as well that the girl guides can you know aim towards and um, I'm so grateful that June Jones and Helena Thomas, Helena Thomas did all the archival work for the girl guiding and it was immaculate so we had something substantial to start working with everything was documented and numbered correctly and when the um, exhibition team from here came out to visit they were stunned because not only had it been done properly but they were using the correct containers to store everything um, so I'm going to invite Viv out now if you don't mind Viv to say a few words about that partnership um, before we invite Kate to speak and then Tom and I promise you we're nearly there then so thank you Viv so Pnam Da I'm afraid that's about all I can say in Welsh, but um, just uh, thank you very much for inviting us to just say something, because we've just had, so far, a very, very exciting journey uh, with PCW um, in trying to digitise our archive. Um, as uh, Hazel said, Avril came along and had a look, because um, we have got a very large archive, and um, it isn't housed in the best place. It's down in a cellar, and the cellar um, gets quite damp at times, so um, we thought, how are we going to ensure that we safeguard this for future generations? National Library, that's the <laughs> thing to do. So, um, because actually the National Library already housed some of um, Lord Davis's um, archives, um, and we, I don't know whether you know, but Branarian in Plandinam used to be uh, one of Lord Davis's homes, 
and in 1986 we purchased it off him. All the brownies and guides um, <coughs> got together and did lots of different activities and uh, we managed to buy this lovely building off him. Um, so we've got some beautiful archives within our house there. Of course, we've got an enormous archive because we have 20,000 members in Wales and each of those um, members have got different archives that they have within their own units and uh, we need to try and safeguard this. So how in heaven's name are we going to do it? So Avril said, okay, um, I'll put you in touch with Hazel. So quite rightly, I went along to the um, uh, Royal Welsh Show and I saw PCW there, the, the great big screen that they were using, and I just fell in love with that. I thought, yay, because if I'm not really an archivist, I'm somebody who loves all this digital stuff and the future, but this actually brings the whole thing together. So we agreed a strategy, didn't we, Hazel, on how we were going to do this, and we started our first course back in October. Um, we started with um, about 18 ladies who came along, all volunteers, um, and they, we had also Helena, who is our archivist, and as Hazel has said, she actually catalogued everything. We could not have done this without Helena's input. It's just absolutely amazing what she's done. And although she's stepping back now, June is our lead volunteer for the, for the actual archives. And... Um, so we decided, um, as we started on this course, that uh, we would try and get young people as well as older people to come together so that we could have some intergenerational work as well. Because the young people don't know the heritage, and the old people, me included, know the heritage, but, oh, sorry, know, yes, the heritage, um, and not necessarily all the digital work. So the two coming together was absolutely brilliant. Of those 18 people, 12 people have already put in um, for the accreditation. We've got our fingers crossed that they might have achieved. Um, we've also started a second course. So, um, and I have uh, 12 people registered on that, and they start again tomorrow on, their se on the second course of that. And we're actually looking towards having another course for young people, our 16 to 25 year olds, and that they're going to come along and also participate. And we've been very lucky in gaining some um, a grant funding from um, the Welsh Government to actually make sure that we have 10 of our young people with that um, qualification by the end of the year. So a bit more work, Hazel. So um, it has been really a fantastic <coughs> journey for us all. We've learned so much. As, as I know all of you have done with all the digitizing, all the metadata, all the um, copyright, oh. <laughs> um, but it, it has been very, very good. And I'm sorry, Mike, you haven't had much from us yet. <laughs> Just wait, because it's coming. <laughs> but um, I do really mean it's been absolutely been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so very, very much. Um, can I just share one thing? That yes, we, have? Sure. we have one lady who loves to take photographs of the minutes. So she spends all her time <laughs> taking photographs of our minute books, and there are hundreds. <laughs> anyway, she was, I think, um, the first one she came across was um, one from 1936. And um, there was a minute in the book, and it said that um, the outdoor team were looking at inviting the Hitler Youth Organization <laughs> to come and have a camp with us. <laughs> Needless to say, it didn't happen. <laughs> and another one she found was in 1947, um, the executive meeting were talking about uniform. And it got quite detailed, and they were talking about the stockings that the ladies would have to wear. And they decided in the end that the stockings would have to be of a particular type, with a seam up the back, and the colour had to be leaf mould. <laughs> so you can, nowadays we talk about health and safety, risk assessment, <laughs> trust these things. So it, it, um, it's certainly been really, really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. We had a wonderful time. We work until almost midnight every time we all get together because we can't put it down. 
and um, I'm just hoping that you enjoy getting what we have. So well, thank, thank you. you. But don't thank go you. anywhere. So as a little surprise for Viv and June and Helena, I'm now going to call Linda James forward from Dusky Brew, please. I don't know if you want to join us, June and Helena, do you, or do you want to stay there? You can stay there if you like, and we'll come to you. Come on to the stage. Mae'r Bwrneriaeth rhwng Dysgu Bro Ceredigion a Chasgiad Werin yn y Llyfrgell Genedlaethol wedi gweithio yn dau iawn, a mae'r nifer o cofrysiadau ac achrediadau yn cynyddu o'r prosiect lwcht i dyrmer mwyr ni heddiw sef Gylgaidyn Cymru. Mae lefel y gwaith a cymrywiaeth y gwaith wedi bod o safon uchel iawn a mae wedi bod yn hynod o diddorol i'w cymryd rolli. The partnership between Dysgu Bro Ceredigion and the People's Collection at the National Library has worked very well, with increased registrations and accreditations since starting with the Cloth Project to today's recipients, the Girl Guiding Wales. The level and range of the work has been of a very high standard and it's been extremely interesting to moderate. So I'm very pleased to say <laughs> <laughs> that I can <laughs> present <laughs> you. Please, 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 please for everyone else who's yes. also qualified. Oh, thank you. The, the three of you personally will get your certificates handed by you. For a moment. No. But anyway. Well, I just add, it's been a pleasure to oh, work with Hazel and all the team Thank you. for their hard work and their enthusiasm. Thank and I'm sure the project will go from strength Thank to you. strength. Well, we couldn't have done it without your help. Okay. No so. problem. Deal. Deal. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier on, um, we have been training the volunteers here as well and we thought today would be a great opportunity just to congratulate and represent Amanda Kay with her certificate for having done the accreditation as one of Gwyneth's volunteers and you know when you speak to Amanda what she's gained from this accreditation is more than just the certificate so if you do get a chance to talk to her during the tea break please do so I'd like to welcome Avril Jones up now and Amanda please if you wouldn't mind Sorry. <laughs> Headbutt. No, a corporate production. <laughs> um, it gives me great pleasure to present the certificate um, for completion of the PCW Digital Training Day to you today. Um, this is proof of the way the PCW actually helps individuals develop skills. Amanda is one of our key volunteers, having delivered over, well, nearly 500 volunteer hours wow. since she... <laughs> in September 2012. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, so now I'm going to invite Kay Hansen up to um, explain to you a little bit about um, her role on the PCW programme. Thank you, Kay. Uh, 
don't fight. Okay, I'm just going to whiz through this now because I'm, I'm sure we're all desperate for a, a nice cup of tea. Um, basically, just wanted to give you a chance just to have a look at some of the ongoing work behind the scenes uh, with the website at the moment. Um, the first thing you'll probably notice is the digital heritage stations. What we're going to do is actually help people to understand the scale of the programme. So you, you will have noticed a few weeks ago that we put the maps up. Um, but what we're actually going to do now is link to a page. So those are the four first ones being shown on the main page there. And then we'll link to uh, all the locations that we're currently operating. And uh, so obviously working with you now in the future, what we're hoping is if it helps you at all, if you want to add information to this, so you want to be able to... Um, encourage people to come in, perhaps we could work together and maybe just give um, a rough idea of your opening times or who to contact um, to find out when people can come along. So this very much will be a work in progress, this page I think over the next year, um, but obviously nothing will happen without discussions between you, what you're comfortable with um, and Hazel is the person to communicate with that. Um, so the other thing that we're going to do now is to start, I think, advertising all the classes that Hazel and her team give. So we're going to dedicate a page to that to encourage more people to sign up um, and um, re reach audiences that we haven't reached already. So hopefully that will... Um, I think this page went live yesterday. I think I flicked this one on, so it's available in, in English and Welsh. So um, that one, that one's live and ready. Uh, the other thing we're working on at the moment, as well, I think, for the digital heritage station, is the where's the marketing? Okay, so Hazel told you very briefly earlier that we're going to look to put some resources up for you because we're, we're very aware that you, you know, rely on putting posters together or events together or little tea parties or, you know, what, whatever events you put, you put together. So we're going to try and make it really easy for you to um, click on items such as the logo that you can then go in and right-click on and save that. Um, and I think we, I've, I've had just about much time to put something that's starting to resemble a poster. I think we're struggling with the Wi-Fi there to get all the graphics through. Um, but this, this will be something that you can print off um, and it'll have all our, all, all our corporate information there ready for you. So they're just resources, and the, the marketing packs that you're taking away, if you can use those in any way, again, those are all going to be up there. There you go, in English and Welsh, for you to hand out as, uh, as you wish. Uh, so that's that going ongoing. And the, so the other major thing that's happening at the moment is all around learning. So what we're, what we're hoping to do, whereas your um, database, um, you, go, you go into search and you can find anybody's profile or anybody's item and have a good rummage around. What we're hoping to do now is to develop that further so that teachers can go in and do the same thing. So if they go into work in the morning and they know their class is going to be studying St. David's Day. Perhaps the institutions have put um, resources on there, like teachers' packs, which are literally just collection of all the information we have rele relevant to that subject. So teachers will literally just be able to go in, click on some buttons, which, bear with me, this is like, we we're almost finished with this page. <laughs> it's almost going live. Um, and... So what will, what will happen is, when I push the buttons, <laughs> they will respond. It is turning on the top. Yeah, it's there. turning on the Oh, there you go. There you go. So this then will be able to sort through 
and find uh, there you go. There's one on World War One there that um, somebody's put together. So, so that that's all we wanted to show you on that. Really, was that we are developing a um, facility for teachers to to be able to tap in to all your resources that our learning officers will put together for you. So, um, it's repurposing con content to a different audience, really. Um, and I think that was, that's about all we're working on at the moment. Although, um, say Hazel, we haven't really got enough time to go into an awful lot of detail, but um, as a team, we tend to take your comments and your feedback very, very seriously. We were at a training group the other day. You will have noticed that um, the main menu here at the top has changed uh, literally overnight. <laughs> we were at a training course, and somebody looked at the top and said, oh, contribute, is that where you give money? And we were like, no, <laughs> no, no, you don't have to give us money, just give us your, your images. So um, we, we really turned, around that, turned that around really quickly. It was like, okay, it makes sense to us as civil servants. We're used to working in institutions where um, in order to sign something like this off, it takes a group of 20 people. It has, then has to be signed off by various directors, and yet yeah, we, we've all worked in these installations far too long. We take everything far too serious, whereas this website is for you. Mm -hmm. So if you have anything that you want to um, tell us, well, you know, you know what, we'd like a button that, that makes this function an awful lot easier, please, please get in touch, and we're open to um, making it a lot easier for you. That's all I wanted to say, thanks. <laughs> Right. So we move to the next slide. <laughs> okay. Should be. Well, that's me. I'm not Kay Hansen. Um, and again, I'll be very, very quick. This is just going to be a, a, a very quick uh, forward look at things that we're working on as a program at the moment. As you, uh, you know, we're all gasping for a cup of tea, so I'm going to be very, very Can you quick. Turn it off, Tom. I've just seen a spelling mistake. <laughs> Where is it? Oh dear. <laughs> quick, quick, move it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right, at least you've got, you got most of the words in the right order. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a quick forward look at uh, some of the things that we're doing. Because the People's Collection, it's a website, it's a programme of outreach and working with communities. It's also a programme of um, looking for opportunities for, for new developments and, and applying new technologies, uh, which is where I come in. And um, one of the things that we're, we're exploring is this idea of, um, of this powered by people's collection idea. What can we do to use our system to enable other people to, <laughs> to build upon it, to use it in new ways, and to bring more material into the system? Um, and really, it's summed up with this, that, that we want to get more people, um, help more people get more good content online in a more sustainable way, and help others to find it and use it. And we, we've got a number of different ways that we're trying to achieve that. Um, Probably the most important development is something that Mike is, is really key to in Hazel's team, which is the development of the API, uh, Application Programming Interface. And um, it's the last time you'll hear that. Um, the, <laughs> but the idea, basically, of the API is it's a, it's a way to automatically get data into the system and a way to automatically get data out of the system for other people to use. Um, and building upon this API will mean that we can get bulk uploads of thousands of items from, um, from community groups, from um, institutions, very quickly and easily into, into the website, and then also allow those to be used in other websites um, creatively. Building upon that idea of the API is the development of widgets and microsites. So um, if you're not familiar with the term a widget, you probably are familiar with seeing widgets when you're browsing the internet. Their widgets are things like the embedded Google search bar that you might see on a website, or the buttons that allow you to click and register on a system for, a, 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 for registering for a conference, like Eventbrite, or embedded Twitter feeds, or embedded Google Maps. These are all uh, examples of widgets. And um, 
what we want to do is develop a range of widgets. What we'll be doing over the coming months is developing a range of widgets that allow um, the embedding of people's collection material in partner websites, in other people's websites. So it could be a local history group, it could be a, a different organisation. Um, but basically we'll, we'll produce these little tools that people can drop into their own systems. Um, and we've got a range of different uh, widget types that we want to have. Those might be object specific. So if you as a group have a website and you've uploaded a series of items to the people's collection, you can embed those back in your site, but maintaining the metadata, the functionality, and all the information that goes with them in the people's collection. Um, we also have other uh, widgets that will allow you to search within the people's collection data from your own website. Um, also, uh, small widgets that allow you to have lists. Let's say you've got a blog and you're very interested in the people's collection. Well, you could have a list of the most recent content that's been added to the people's collection in the sidebar of your website. And then we've got account-specific and location-specific websites. So uh, <coughs> widgets. So let's say you're a um, uh, a local history group or a local organisation that's uploaded material to the people's collection. Girl Guides may have a website. Well, they could embed within their website all of their own content that's in the people's collection. And that way people don't have to leave your website to view it, but we still get uh, credit or view, the, you know, the viewing information, the analytics that show people are accessing the, the, the material through the website. And you can use all the metadata that goes with our content to help filter that stuff. So if you've got a website about the First World War and uh, you're only interested in Pembrokeshire, you can embed a widget that would only show you First World War related material in Pembrokeshire through one of our, uh, one of our widgets. Moving on from that, we're also looking um, for opportunities to develop things called microsites. So this is scaling that idea up a bit again. Microsites, basically they allow you to develop your own website um, but use the technical development that's happened on the PCW over the last five years. So our infrastructure that allows our site to work will be available for people to put all their content in. Um, but then they can maintain, you know, everybody wants to have their own website because it allows them to get to tell their specific story in their own way, with their own graphics, with their own branding. So this is a way of achieving that, but without losing the, the sustainability and the metadata and the, the benefits of putting your material into the people's collection. So it's, you know, allowing, um, uh, yeah, it basically allows all that freedom but guarantees the permanent accessibility of that digital material on the PCW website. And it also reduces costs. One of the main <coughs> expenditures that happens when people get grant funding quite often is, you know, a big chunk of that goes into developing the website and then three years down the line or, you know, however long, what's going to happen when the grant funding runs out? Well, Hopefully, we're coming up with an idea here that will help these things be more sustainable and um, and lower cost at lower cost to develop in the first place. And then um, the final thing I wanted to talk about very briefly was the um, Culture Beacon project. This is um, uh, a project which is really about taking the content from the people's collection and putting it back in the places where it's from in the community, and then providing digital access to it. Uh, where and when it's of most use. Um, it's a, basically it's, a, it's an app um, that uses iBeacon technology. Uh, and cleverly, I've left my iBeacon in my bag, but I don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's a small Bluetooth beacon which uh, triggers the display of content on a smartphone or a tablet device. So uh, as you walk around, your device is notified that there's interesting content nearby. It's a really easy to use um, cloud-based uh, content management system, which basically means that anyone can become uh, a mobile app developer using this system and using the content from the, from the people's collection. Um, it's a system that's been developed by a Welsh company called Lockley, who are based up in Bangor. And um, <coughs> it allows people to either become, well, it allows anyone to become a beacon creator and us all to become uh, beacon users with our devices. So these iBeacons, they work in a way 
Uh, they use low energy Bluetooth transmission. This is getting really technical. This is <laughs> low, low energy Bluetooth transmission, which allows you to um, calibrate the uh, device that picks up on this to decide whether you want it to display content when you're very, very close, you know, within centimeters of a beacon, or a long way away, within 100 meters. Uh, it wakes up your device, it tells them that something there and then it displays it. Probably the easiest way to explain it is to show you it being used uh, at the National Slate Museum. I've just got to come through to Internet Explorer to show you that. Um, where are we? Beacons of the National Slate Museum. Yeah. That's the one. So, uh, the music's going to be loud, I'm going to warn you. Anyway. <laughs> but basically, we piloted this technology at the National Slate Museum where we installed 25 beacons around the site. I'll just let you see the way it works. So you put together your, your content in a series of content cards, which are like mini web pages. Uh, you associate each card or series of cards with a beacon, which you saw there in the shot. And as you walk around, it automatically tells your device to display the relevant content. You have a series of cards down the left-hand side, and the main frame is filled with each card that you've selected. You can have images, video, audio, text, um, all embedded within that. There we are. And you can also have widgets embedded within this. Widgets that allow you to do things like show then and now photos, contrasting them with a the slider, or draw your own cup of tea uh, <laughs> as well. Um, one of the benefits in the museum environment is that where there are demonstrations that only happen at certain times in the day, you can make those demonstrations available permanently to anyone at any time because you just embed the video in the, in the device. An interesting other way that they can be used is, uh, and they've done this at the National Slate Museum, is you can give the beacons to members of staff and as members of staff are within range of people that are walking around, they, the visitor can be notified about that member of staff's specialism. So you can say, oh, you know, so-and-so, he, he knows all about slate spitting, I'll, I'll have a word with him. Or, you know, whether that would go down well with the staff of the, the National <laughs> Library, I'm not sure. But it's an interesting application of the technology. All right, I'll move on. Uh, sorry. Wait, we can stop. There we are. Um, so it's an interesting technology, and it's something that we're, we're, we're working with a number of different community groups to pilot around Wales. You can do interesting things like looking then, you can gather analytics on where people stop, where people hang around, where people miss in their, in their journeys. You can also program it. What's interesting with this technology is you can program it so that different people have different experiences. So if they spend a particular length of time at one point in a, in a tour or around, um, you can offer them more information. So you can say, well, you've been there for three minutes. You're obviously quite into this place, offer them some more information. You can also log whether people have visited a location before, and if they have, you can offer them different information then. So it's very programmable and very um, uh, easy to offer uh, a different experience to different people as they walk around. And we're not just doing it, you know, it's easy to do this sort of thing in a, in a museum because it's a controlled environment, you can shut the gates and you can, you know, send people to the cafe when it doesn't work. There's other things for people to do. But we've also piloted it with a, um, a community group in Nevin. Uh, they're the first community group who have actually taken this on and, and developed it themselves. Uh, and we chose Nevin because um, they're close to uh, Lamberis and they've come to the site and seen it. They're very keen. They've got a, a history in, in trying out some digital projects. Um, they, wanted to, they wanted to do it. So... Um, we said, okay, we'll offer you some help. And they were amazing. They did the whole work, all of the work themselves, all the digitization themselves, all the research themselves, and they turned the whole thing around and had a live system within a month of us running a workshop with them to, to learn how to use the system. One of the key things in developing it is that they repurposed existing <coughs> content. And most places out there, Lampeter, you know, Newcastle, Emily, and every, every small, small town, small village, has some resources. They have either local history books, they have 
leaflets about the history of the place. They have interpretation panels. And Nevin's no different. They had a series of things that they could call upon, little walk-in routes, little bits of information that had already been produced. And they just brought all this together and put it together on this digital platform. Um, they worked with lots of other people here, loads of text. Uh, they worked with um, the local museum, with the local archaeological trust, different companies, the RNLI. They all came together and got lots of information. And um, again, I'll just show you very briefly the work that they did because it's worth seeing how it works. Um, if I just come to this one. <laughs> So this is the Maritime Museum in Nevin. And again, just to show you how it works on the day. So they already have been very successful in getting grant funding to fund the development of this museum. But what can you do when the museum's closed out of season? How do you tell people about the town itself? So you can see there it works on... Oh, the Wi-Fi's struggling. But you can see there it's working on a <laughs> phone. It works on a phone, it works on a tablet. Um, and as you walk around the town, they've put these beacons in different locations. Even up in the trees in the centre of the town, they've been cable tied into the branches because they're waterproof, the battery lasts for three years, uh, they're low cost, and, and it's a really easy way of, of getting the information out there. So I will just finish off, let's have a look, by saying I won't go into the detail of. Uh, how you can make it sustainable, but you can make it sustainable. It's one of the things that we've, um, one of the questions that's important for us to answer is how can communities do this and keep it going live? Well, there are loads of opportunities, and if you're from a community that might be interested in pursuing this sort of thing, we've got lots of ideas about ways that you can develop a system that works with local businesses uh, that benefits both ways, that benefits the local business because it drives more um, tourists and visitors to visit their businesses but also benefits you because the businesses host and pay for the beacons that are the, the trigger for all this content. Um, and there's more information online at uh, culturebeacon.org um, and as we develop the API further with the People's Collection we're going to have uh, a live link between the People's Collection data and this interface so you'll be able to draw your content from your accounts and other accounts in the People's Collection and put it together to create these um, culture beacon experiences. Um, so that's it. So thank you for listening. My task today is to bring this afternoon's event to a close and then we'll all go for tea. <laughs> I'd like to start by thanking you all uh, for embracing the People's Collection and for making today's celebratory event possible. A special thank you to all our speakers for sharing their knowledge of the People's Collection service and for the excellent presentations sharing experiences and achievements of working with PCW in several different communities in Wales and the world. I would also like to thank Hazel and the People's Collections team here at the Library for organising today's event and the PCW teams across the National Museum, the Royal Commission and the Library for delivering an excellent service. Diolch heavy di Camal am e Cefnogaeth. Thank you also to Camal for their support. I'm sure that you will all wish to join me in thanking our speakers today. Rwy'n sicr eich bod yn barod i ymuno a fi i ddiolch i'n siaradwyr heddiw. Linda Thomas, June Francoise, Hazel Thomas, Emyr Price y Pencampwr o Landeilo, Fred Long a Dave Williams, Viv Craig, Kay Hansen a Tom Pert. Please join me in showing your appreciation. <laughs> remains now is for me to invite you to join us for tea and to wish you all a safe journey home. If you do have time before you leave the library, we have four excellent exhibitions available. Um, Shani Rhys James, a distillation of 30 years of her work. Publisher and plunderer, Sir John Priest and the first Welsh books. The storyteller's spell, Tichel Jones's centenary. 
and Llangrannog, Cyfnod Mewn Amser, um, an exhibition that has been facilitated by digitisation work undertaken by People's Collection Wales. Diolch yn Pawb. Thank you. 